And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, where, like it or not, uh, it appears the NBA is on the verge of returning in Orlando to finish the 2019-2020 season. Um, and to sort all of the complexities of this plan that was revealed today by Woj and will be voted on tomorrow, I, I had to call the smartest person I know and the one with the most math and tech skills, and that's Kevin Pelton. How are you doing, sir? Uh, you've been saying hanging in there. I think that's, uh, that's about appropriate right now. Yeah. Look, uh, do I really want to be talking about, uh, play in tournaments and NBA things now? No, not particularly, but, um, it is still a part of my job and we're going to balance everything, um, as, as best we can. And so this is the conversation we are having today. If you don't want to listen to it, I completely understand that. Don't listen to it. If you are interested in the NBA season resuming, this is, uh, a conversation about that. Mr. Pelton. According to Woj, and, and I've verified most of this in my own reporting, the NBA tomorrow, the governors will be voting on a plan to return. Uh, 22 teams will be invited. Uh, that's nine teams in the East and 13 teams in the West. Uh, there will be eight regular season games per team, which means that, interestingly, as we will get into, teams will end up having played different numbers of games for the full season, which has uh, actually very important implications. Then there will be a play-in tournament, potentially, for the eighth seed in both conferences, in each conference, whatever the grammatically correct way of saying that is, uh, it will only happen if the ninth seed is within four games of the eighth seed, and uh, it will only be contested between the eighth and the ninth seed, which actually sort of surprised me given that the Western Conference seems to be fertile grounds for a robust multi-team, triple-team, quadruple-team play-in tournament. Okay, KP, this is really complicated. Uh, I have a lukewarm to eh reaction to the whole thing. Just to, whatever strikes your fancy. What what do you like? What do you not like? What's interesting to you about this rigmarole of stuff? I mean, should we start by talking about the fact that there's 22 teams? It it's an unwieldy number, and you know, I I didn't really have a good sense when Woj first reported this, and you know, uh, we had I think you were part of that reporting as well last week that it was. That they were leaning towards 22 with 20 also as a possibility. 20 was a number that made sense to me because there are four teams in the Western Conference that very clearly have a shot at the playoffs. And, you know, we can get into in a second that Phoenix is not one of them, even though they're relatively close in the standings. And then Washington, you know, no one was really thinking of them as a playoff contender. They're not that they're not eliminated, but they had the hardest schedule remaining when we were going to play the original schedule. They have not really given any indication that they're going to make a run at Orlando or Brooklyn for that last spot. So, you know, I think what, what sort of became clear looking at the way that was, this was outlined today is the NBA wanted to get as many teams as possible in Orlando, but they didn't want anyone there without anything to play for. And so this technically gives everyone something to play for. And that's, I think, how you land at 22 teams. Yeah, I just don't get why Washington and Phoenix are there. There's a very clear drop off after 20 to teams 21 and 22. And Washington is five games out. Phoenix is six games out with five teams to jump. Like those teams are not, uh, Phoenix has no chance to make the playoffs. So they're just, I don't know why they're there. I guess they're there to balance the conferences. And you could do this same plan. The, I pitched a whole different plan. We could talk about it if you want. There was obviously the World Cup plan that was 20 teams. My plan was 20 teams. You could f forget those. You could do this exact plan with 20 teams. You just don't have a play in tournament in the Eastern Conference. Um, what you do is you play the eight regular season games. You play the play in tournament in the West, as we've described it, which is a maximum of two games. So it's not as if without a play in in the East, that the Eastern Conference teams are just sitting around there doing nothing while there's this enormous play-in tournament in the Western Conference. And then you could say, well, well, boy, well, why even play these eight regular season games for the East? What's the point of that? That's kind of boring. And I say, no, I say, no, Kevin Pelton. Seeds four, <laughs> five, and six between Miami, Indiana, and Philadelphia are still very much up in the air in the Eastern Conference. Seeds seven and eight between Brooklyn and Orlando are separated by half a game. And that has huge implications because both of those teams would very much like to avoid Milwaukee in the first round. No disrespect for the number two seed defending champion Toronto Raptors. Very good team. No disrespect for the current three seed Boston Celtics. Very very good team. Brooklyn and Orlando would rather play you guys than Milwaukee. Um, and so I think there would be plenty of interest in that. So I just don't see the purpose of Washington and Phoenix being there other than to just add more games to the schedule, which doesn't make 
I mean, you're already adding a lot of games to this. You're already getting a pretty good amount of games by bringing 20 and doing this exact thing. The marginal gain of adding whatever X amount of games you, you add by adding these two teams versus 70 more people when you, when you are and claim to be concerned about the spread of COVID-19, I just don't see the reason for them to be there. And if the play in tournament in the West is going to be a maximum, a maximum of two games, that's not even a play in tournament. That's not even a tournament. We need a different name for that. That's right. not a tournament. That's a mini series or something like that. If that's all it's going to be, then yeah, the East teams can jockey for a top eight, sit around for three days and then the playoffs start. I don't get why. No, I, look, Wizards, Suns fans, I'm sorry. I don't think that they should be there, and I don't understand why they are there. And which is probably what the East teams are going to do under this scenario anyway. I mean, the odds of Washington being able to get within four games of either Orlando or Brooklyn, you know, I ballparked it around one in five. So, you know, 80% of the time, the East is just going to be watching as the West does a play-in tournament, which is very, very likely to happen out there. Let's get into the play-in tournament, and we'll start in the East because it's it's more simple. Here's what it is. If Washington gets within four games of the number eight team at the end of these eight regular season games, whether that's Brooklyn or Orlando, here's how the mini series works. They play one game, Brooklyn slash Orlando versus Washington. If Brooklyn or Orlando wins, the tournament is over. They're the eighth seed. If Washington wins, they play again, and it's a winner-take-all for the number eight seed. And I actually think... That's still too advantageous for Washington. I think they could have built a sliding scale in here where if it's four games, Washington's got to win four in a row. If the get deficit is three games, you got to win three in a row. If the def- then you can get, if it's lower than that, then you can get to like two in a row and you're in. I, you know, look, if Washington comes in and they go six and two and they pick up three games on Orlando and Brooklyn, then yeah, by all means, give them like a two wins and in scenario. If they go two and six, and the deficit gets even greater than that, or 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 the deficit stays at four games exactly. If it's four games exactly, I just think they should have to win more than two games. That's my that's I, that's just my take. I mean, it is still probably a bigger advantage than you know when we were talking about playing tournaments long before the stoppage of play, long before the pandemic. You know, I don't know if there necessarily was going to be a double elimination situation, but it was going to be kind of a ladder where some teams would be able to, you know, seven versus eight, maybe play and that winner directly gets in. And then the loser of that has to play the nine seed and still has a chance. And you'd have home court. That's the other thing that I think the NBA is trying to make up for here is, well, we, we don't have any home court to offer teams, which is something that uh, our colleague Dave McMenamin wrote about the other night. Teams kind of trying to find ways to make up home court advantage. First which- of all, first of all, let's just stop for a second. Whoever is the team that is proposing these rules, you want an extra pos- – you want to get the ball at the start of every quarter? You want LeBron to get seven fouls or Giannis to have seven fouls? Get all the way out of here. I hope that they bring that up at the competition committee. I really hope that whoever is pitching those ideas says, hey, uh, uh, Adam, Adam, can I just have the floor for, for – Just I just need the floor for a minute. I, I got something really creative to run by you guys. Just stay with me here. Seven fouls. <laughs> seven fouls. What? Do, think about that. Seven fouls. What do you think? No, I don't have any votes in support of my best player getting seven fouls. No. Okay, back. Resume the meeting. I was. I want to be in the meeting when they bring it up. I mean, it's also going to be very hard to get the other teams that don't have a chance at this to vote for your proposal to help your teams. Like, uh, yeah, that's that's not working out. I don't think. The more interesting scenario to me is in the West, where <laughs> I actually think they've done a nice job of 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 giving Memphis an advantage because Memphis has a three and a half game lead. You know as well as I do that the last 18 games or whatever of their schedule were going to be very unfriendly to them and very friendly on the flip side for New Orleans to the point that 538 actually had New Orleans as a better than 50% chance to win the eighth seed outright. So Memphis now, th- those teams have very little time to make up three and a half games. What you ran simulations, like in what in what percentage of your simulations is Memphis finishing these eight regular season games in the eighth slot? Uh, about 80% of the time. So, okay. So that's an enormous, so 80% of the time, not only does Memphis not fall back at all, they, they stay in eighth, which means they enter the play in tournament with this win, two chances to win one advantage, which I think, I, I know that I had heard through other sources that Memphis was unhappy with the entire idea of a play in tournament. I understand that. Um, very few teams have blown a three and a half game lead in 17 games. 
I do think this was one such, uh, this was a particular season in which the chances of that were much greater than usual. I think Memphis has to be happy with this because to me, unless you totally fall on your face, your worst case scenario probably is going to be you finish eighth and you have two chances to win one game. Yeah, I, I think it reasonably balances the fact that, you know, teams like New Orleans aren't going to get a chance to take advantage of the schedule that they were set to play over the remainder of the regular season if we had played all 82 games against the fact that, yeah, I mean, three and a half games is a large amount to make up. So, you know, I think I don't think that fairness was necessarily the guiding light for the NBA on this. I think it's probably somewhat more about entertainment and, uh, you know, trying to maximize what teams have to play for that are coming to Orlando. But I do think they landed on a pretty fair system in the West that is going to give a number of teams because, you know, they're, it, I, if Phoenix in these simulations I ran did not get into the ninth spot once. So they, they don't seem to have much of a chance, but so the just, other so what teams, you're saying is, what you're saying is Phoenix, according to your simulations, and in my head, you've run one billion simulations <laughs> on your like no, supercomputer no, that's in your house. Phoenix has a literal 0% chance to make the playoffs. I mean, it was a, it was a hundred simulations. I, I had to work on this very quickly and, and we are having to make some assumptions about the schedule, which I'm sure we can talk about in a moment, what that's going to look like. But, uh, the other four teams all get in there at least 10% of the time. So that it's, it's pretty wide open from that standpoint. I just, I mean, I don't want to be facetious about it. I hope Phoenix gets in and out of Disney World healthy. I, I, that's all because I don't see any purpose to them being there. I get, I guess their young players get, like pseudo playoff experience or something. I don't know. Um, I don't really see any purpose. And, you know, the health stuff is, you know, we're sitting here kind of making fun of the, the conceits and, you know, and, and the complexities of all this that make your head spin. But, you know, the bottom line is the NBA is trying to do this during a pandemic. And, and today I think for the first time as all this news broke, they started to get up, beat up a little bit in the media for putting the, the cart ahead of the horse, the horse ahead of the cart. I guess the cart ahead of the horse, whatever the, the thing horse. is for doing, going too fast. Definitely um, the first. Um, I, because all these details are coming out. And as our friend Henry Abbott pointed out, Adam Silver has spoken essentially no public words in a long time, uh, about the realities of how this is all going to work in terms of testing. And, um, what about coaches over 60? Who's wearing a mask? How are people going to sit on the bench? Um, how are people going to be quarantined? How strict is that going to be? What happens if a player tests positive? What player, what happens if four players on the same team test positive? Uh, and I, I think actually what's happened is not that the NBA has neglected those things because they haven't. And I know that they haven't because I've talked to all the people that are working on it. The NBA has actually taken behind the scenes great care and research to try their very best to get those things right. I think what's happened is that the NBA doesn't want to talk about any of that until they feel like they have what is their best final answer to it as we approach the arrival of people in Orlando. But I, I don't think, I don't, I think the absence of information has been unfairly conflated with an assumption that the NBA has not done their homework, which they have. But, you know, the bottom line is, I mean, everyone's getting excited for this thing to come back. Nobody really knows if it's, if it's going to happen. And if we're going to get to the finish line, I mean, I think there's hope that you get to the finish line, but this is a huge unknown. And, you know, everyone, I don't, you know, I, the NBA is taking it seriously. I hope they're taking it seriously enough, but this is dangerous. It's dangerous. And the, I mean, that, the, not the NBA coming back. The virus is dangerous. And, um, I, you know, again, the over, we can get into the mechanics of this and that. The overriding thing here has to be, I just hope everyone gets in and out of there safely. Yeah, I mean, you can't make any guarantees. I mean, this is an undertaking. There are some leagues around the world, obviously, that are playing right now with, you know, similar mitigation strategies, but it's not exactly the same as in the U.S. It's in places where transmission is much lower than it is in the U.S. in general right now, even though that obviously varies from region to region. So, yeah, I like you, I have... I have confidence that the NBA is taking this aspect of it very seriously, but we also, I think, have to ask these questions because oh, you have to. They, they thought they were taking it very seriously in early March, and it turned out in hindsight that, what, you know, 5% of the league at least tested positive? 
I, I don't know what the percentage was. And, and but the reality is, I don't think very many of us were taking it as seriously as we should have in early March. And it, it was a very weird sensation to be reading and watching reports of what was happening in Italy and Spain and knowing, well, you know, I know how I know how this works. It's coming. It's we're like watching our own lives on a like two weeks ahead of time or a week ahead of time. And and yet I went to the Sloan Conference. I went to two NBA games at in Boston during the Sloan Conference, which is right. Like I, I don't really think I can criticize other people for not taking it seriously when I myself was not taking it seriously. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about the play in tournament again because this stuff is wacky and fun, and we'll never get. We hopefully we'll never have a season this this crazy again. So to to your point and my point about Memphis getting, I think a fair advantage. Let's just say they go four and four. No, no, no guarantee given that they were facing a very difficult schedule. And my educated guess is the NBA will try to replicate their schedule difficulty of what their schedule difficulty was going to be over these eight games that they're going to play. If they go four and four, New Orleans has to go eight and oh to pass New Orleans. Who's, who's essentially, who's tied with the Kings and a half game ahead of the Spurs. So just could just assume all this applies to all those teams. Apologies, sons. I'm not talking about you. Um, New Orleans has to go eight and oh to pass them. If they go seven and one, they still end up a half game behind Memphis because Memphis has played one more game than both New Orleans and Sacramento. And so if you get a scenario where Memphis finishes 36 and 37 and one of those teams finishes 35 and 37, so they're tied in the loss column, I think what's going to happen is guess what? Memphis wins because their win percentage is better. And it's only better because they played one more game in a random total fluke of luck. Um, but I think in these kind of circumstances, there's no perfect solution to any of this. And they're just going to default to, well, their winning percentage is better. They get the eighth seed. They go into this play in with an advantage. I mean, there's an, there's an even stranger scenario that could come into play, which is what if Portland and New Orleans end up tied for ninth like they are right now, but Portland has played two more games. And because of the fact that they've gone one and one, even though those two teams are still an equal number of games back of Memphis, if you go by percentage points, the fact that Portland's one and one brings them one one thousandth of a point closer to 500 means that they win the tie, I guess. I, I Look, all of this will be finalized tomorrow on Thursday. But maybe it won't all be finalized tomorrow on Thursday. I don't know. We're recording this at 5 Eastern time on Wednesday. So some details are still yet to trickle out. My my hunch is Portland will win based on winning percentage in the scenarios you described. Because they went 1-1 one and one in two extra games, their winning percentage will be a tick higher. And if all those teams finish quote-unquote tied in the standings, Portland will win, which means New Orleans and... Sacramento and the Spurs all have to outplay Portland by a game in order to get it. Forget Memphis. Let's assume Memphis gets eighth. All those teams have to outperform Portland by one full game to hop over Portland. To, to, playing equivalent doesn't get it done. They lose by one percentage every time. The Spurs, because they've played one fewer game than both New Orleans and Sacramento and two fewer games than the Blazers have to jump over all three of those teams. The Spurs have to leap, uh, have to outplay the Kings and the Pelicans and the Blazers all by a game, all because of this quirk of winning percentage. And is it fair? I don't know, but I don't know what else you can do. I mean, you can start getting funky with head-to-head tiebreakers and this and that, but I think the simplest default is to go by winning percentage, which, as you said, opens up some absolutely crazy scenarios. Yeah. So should we get into the schedule aspect of this? Because I think that's really interesting as well. So there, yeah, was... there, there are two un, there are two big unknowns that hopefully will be answered tomorrow. Maybe not. Number one is who are the teams playing? And you have, I think, crafted a potential answer to that. And number two is uh, what happens to the draft lottery if uh, the current playoff field changes between now and when the playoffs start. But yes, talk about the schedule. Yeah, so Vinny Goodwill of Yahoo had a report that, you know, essentially the starting point is going to be you play the next eight games in your schedule. Now, if you start to look at that, you realize that that is not literally possible because some teams or the next eight games in your schedule, I should say, that involve teams that are going to Orlando and you just throw out all the other games. But some teams have, you know, eight games and then the opponent who's your eighth opponent, it's their 10th game. So right. that can't work for both teams. Can't work. So, but you I, have figured out a solution. 
I mean, I, I have no idea, but you know, whether this is actually how the NBA is planning to do it, but the way you could do it is basically you take all the games that are in the top eight for both teams and then you match up other remaining games that fit within both teams need to play eight games. And that leaves you three games short. You'd have to schedule an extra game between Portland and LA who played three times this year in the West. So it's reasonable that they'd play a fourth time. And then you'd have to play two cross either. You'd either have to play two games between Portland and LA or play two cross conference games. One of those teams plays Orlando. One of them plays Miami. And that gets you a full schedule with all teams playing eight times in Orlando. So that and, and adhering as closely as possible to what their subsequent eight games were supposed to be had the NBA not suspended the season. Which I think is a, a reasonable starting point. I think that's but- very fair. I think that's fair. Because you're gonna lose look, you're obviously losing all the games against the very worst teams who are gonna stop trying to win anyway in March and April in the NBA. Um so, but you, you have to do your best to approximate what it was. And so, for instance, with New Orleans, who we all know is going to have the easiest schedule in the league, um, they're following eight games against teams that are going to Orlando, their, their next eight games. Six of those games are against teams that are battling for the eighth seed in either conference, mostly from the West and then a game against Orlando. They get two games against the Kings, which is important for reasons we'll talk about later, and a game and two games against the Grizzlies, which is important for reasons everybody understands. So to me, New Orleans, in that scenario, their schedule is absolutely representative of what it would have been because even though they're playing all Orlando teams, six of the eight are against teams that are right in their wheelhouse, teams they frankly should beat if if they are as good as they looked with Zion, which feels like five years ago, right? I mean, they, that's that's a that's a manageable schedule for them. Yeah, so if you use that the the schedule that I outline and I rated teams using their basketball power index BPI rating right now, New Orleans still has the easiest schedule in the league in that eight games. What's interesting is that Memphis, which had the hardest schedule before the uh the shutdown, they're middle of the pack in terms of schedule strength. Why, what ha- what, what happened? Because I'm because I'm looking at their slate of games and it's absolutely brutal. So what what's happening in, in your rejiggering of the schedule to to make it easier for them? You know, I'm not sure, but I I think part of it is just that everybody else's schedule is getting so much harder right, because right. you know that's that's one thing I don't think is getting enough consideration here is all these teams that are competing for the play in spots. They don't get to play teams way worse than them anymore. They don't get to play the teams that are tanky at the bottom of the standings. They're all gone. So everybody's schedule is enormously difficult. That easiest schedule in the league that I mentioned with New Orleans is still harder than an average schedule would be over the course of the season. So here's Memphis's next eight games. Portland. It still says at Portland. So Portland. uh, You know, maybe Dame gets seven fouls. I don't know. Portland. uh, Utah. (laughs) San Antonio, Oklahoma City. Now it gets interesting. Milwaukee is the fifth game. And then you start to think if you're Memphis, well, Milwaukee by that time, I mean, they've got it locked up already. Maybe, maybe we get the JV Milwaukee team. Uh, New Orleans, New Orleans consecutively, which is obviously huge. And then ending with Boston, which again, I mean, Boston right now is, uh, going into this is, Three games behind number two and three games ahead of number four. So pretty squished into number three. Maybe you get down to that and you get the JV Celtics too. So Memphis might actually catch some scheduling breaks depending on how the, the first few regular season games go. But that's on paper, that's tough. And it gives New Orleans, New, it, it remain, it gives New Orleans the, the same head to head ability to narrow the gap as it would have had anyway. Well, I mean, now the one thing we don't know is how these games will actually or be scheduled in terms of order, if they even go with this format, because you would have to play around with it. You can't go necessarily the days yes, that, that's true. that are now. But it would be very funny if Boston and Memphis played in the last game of the season, because Boston could suddenly have huge incentive to win to try to improve their draft pick. That's true. Um, so we, we'll, 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 get, we'll get there. Um, again, I don't know exactly. We don't know the exact mechanics of how all this is going to work. Um, but Sacramento and New Orleans, again, they enter tied at 28 and 36. They are slated, potentially slated, if the league schedules it in, in this weird way, or your approximation of it, they are slated to play twice, which is important because the season series between New Orleans and Sacramento, the two teams who could tie exactly in the standings for ninth, 
um, is currently 1-0 New Orleans. That's it. So if they were to play one more, your next tiebreaker would th- probably be head-to-head. And if you only play once more, you could tie there too. And I think after that, I don't know what happens. Whoever who, – you play golf at Disney World and whoever loses I, goes out. Um, so if they continue to play twice, if they play twice, someone will at least win the head to head tiebreaker, which would solve that issue. But there's just so many weird, there's going to be so many weird quirks to this. Yeah. And also then, you know, you, if you end up playing teams twice in Orlando, you're getting potentially a very different version of those teams than you would have faced, uh, back in March. I mean, I, you know, if you're someone who has Portland on the schedule, you know, you were probably going to have to play Yusuf Nurkic because he was due back the the Sunday after play shut down. But you probably weren't going to have to play Zach Collins for a period of time. And now it looks like both of those guys will probably be available for the Blazers uh, after whatever mini training camp they have. And Memphis, I mean, uh, both Jaron Jackson and Brandon Clark were injured when the season was suspended, which I think was part of the reason why there was pessimism about Memphis. Now, they were so, both, I believe, were slated to return pretty shortly after March 11th when the season stopped. Presumably, they are fully, fully healthy now. So Memphis will be similar to the Memphis team that was at full strength, at least before the trade deadline when they made some pretty large trades or one pretty could, large could trade get, with Miami. Well, they could get Justice Winslow now. That's right. Um, so, the, the, I, boy, boy, oh boy. There's all, this is all, I mean, this is going to be, if, if they actually, if we get there and we get all these games, there's, there's many interesting permutations. But I think the bottom line is, I, I don't, I don't love 22 teams. I, I'd be interested to see what you, what you, method you prefer, but I, I do think they've given Memphis, I think they've given Memphis everything the Grizzlies could have asked for in a play-in scenario. I think they've they've given Memphis a lot of chances. If if Memphis doesn't make the playoffs, I don't think they can whine about it. I, I think they've been given enough of an advantage. But what what was your favorite of all the proposals, or maybe there was one you that was never proposed that you like? What would you have done if you're czar of the NBA? What would you have done? I mean, I probably would have used the opportunity to to seed one through sixteen because. You know, I, I'm not generally in favor of that. I, I do like the historical rival aspect, rivalry aspect of it, which I think you've, you've spoken about fondly as well. But to me, the travel is, if not a non-starter, at least a significant concern to me out here on the West Coast, uh, knowing what it's like to travel across the country, even if it's much easier to do it in a, in a charter plane. Uh, and then the element, the other element that people don't talk about is it's a time zone issue. If you get, you know, if your uh, conference semifinals, three of those, you know, six of those eight teams play in the Eastern time zone or five of them play in the Pacific time zone, all of a sudden you've got some issues in terms of figuring out when games are going to start. And both of those things are no longer issues if everyone is in the same place. I I actually disagree that I didn't want them to do one to 16 this year. I didn't th- I don't feel that the standings merit. A one, like one to 16 to me is supposed to fix an injustice that an undeserving, usually East team is in the playoffs over a much better West team. And I don't see there, that's not the case this year. Now, again, if Portland and New Orleans get fully healthy or had the opportunity to get fully healthy, maybe it would feel that way or what it, it would have felt that way. But as things stand now, I don't see anything like that. And to me, without that, it doesn't justify midstream, um, completely changing the bracket to to something that gives some teams a little bit easier road and some teams a little bit of a harder road, including the Bucks, who would have to go through both Los Angeles teams, I believe, in that scenario to win the title. Um, so I, I, you know, but then again, I proposed a much more complicated <laughs> idea that would, that would have had teams going for all over the place potentially. So, I mean, you know, so, so you would have seeded 1 to 16. And would you have started just bring 16 teams, that's it? I think I probably would have done some play in tournament, but I was, I was sympathetic to the arguments that like, Hey, let's keep this simple. Let's keep the numbers as low as possible and just bring 16 teams and, you know, send half of them home as quickly as is reasonably possible so that we limit just the number and the exposure risk. Do you see it? What else before we get into the lottery implications of this and everything else? What, what, what have we touched on that's, that's, um, that's interesting to you. Is, is, is there any team that's, that you think has been given an advantage? I mean, we could talk about the playoff teams too, because you've written a little bit about, about that. I mean, I think the, 
the the race for the fifth seed or maybe the fourth seed in the East is is really important in terms of you know who matches up with who and that's you know Miami's two games up on the Pacers and the Sixers who are tied the Sixers are in sixth by virtue of a tiebreaker and then in the West four five I mean three to six are really close they're separated by two games in the loss column like there could be I know there's no home court. But right. matchups are matchups are still matchups. There's cer- still certain teams that don't want to play each other or or prefer a different opponent. So what have we not touched on about what's actually going to happen that's interesting to you? Yeah, I think there's a lot of variability in the Western Conference in terms of how those teams move around, and not just three to six. I think Dallas potentially could as well. You know, they've got the third best dip point differential in the conference to date. Uh, we'll see what kind of Luka Doncic they get after the break. Uh, you know, there's certainly concerns about where his conditioning is going to be. But, you know, in 50% of those simulations I ran, they ended up moving up from seventh. And that's really, really? important because, yeah, I mean. 50%. Wow. Because they're three games back in the loss column. But like you said, I mean, I knew that. I know, obviously, they've had a very good season. Their point differential is neck and neck with the Clippers and like way ahead of everybody else between the Clippers and them. It's, it's actually, I didn't know it was, I didn't realize it was that stark. Yeah. And, uh, they've got, you know, a middle of the road schedule if you play it out like we've talked about, but then that would potentially allow them to avoid the Clippers in the first round of the playoffs. And that's a bigger impact than I think. You know, I don't have strong feelings about who I'd want to play three to six. I think it probably depends just on who you end up matching up against the best. Uh, the other thing you mentioned before we started doing the podcast is the potential for some tankery with Washington and Phoenix. The downside of inviting them could be that if they start slowly, um, they say, well, let me look at the standings here. If I go, <laughs> if I, if I really tank, um, I can, I can maybe slide slide past slide back past some teams who aren't here um i actually think in washington's case that's a little unlikely so if washington goes two and six they remain percentage points ahead of charlotte and significant percentage points ahead of chicago they have to go one and seven to slide back past charlotte which is the next team behind them in the east and they have to go oh and eight to slide back uh behind charlotte and chicago my hu- <laughs> My hunch is the NBA would not reward – my hope is that the NBA would not reward Washington with better lottery odds if they come to this tournament and go 0-8. However, I would say that that's what you deserve for inviting Washington to this <laughs> tournament is if they go 0-8 and they improve their lottery odds and Michael Jordan and the Reinsdorfs are furious about it. But, I, you know, this and, – and Washington and Phoenix could actually jockey with each other a little bit for lottery odds. That's That's in play, right? It is, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a strange scenario because there's obviously there's tanking every year, but tanking where one team or two teams aren't involved at all because their seasons are over and other teams are playing would be, you know, novel in NBA history. And you know, I don't think Washington's going to go in with that mindset. I think that they probably wanted to play, believe that they can go on a little bit of a run here or something. But you know, if they start slowly, then all of a sudden it may become clear they can't get into that play in. And now what point is there to continue playing Bradley Beal and, you know, trying to win these games and also their schedule. They have a couple of easier, easy-ish games. They have Brooklyn on their schedule and they have lo and behold, the Phoenix suns in this, in what we've outlined here. Oh baby, uh, get ready for that but, game. But the rest of their upcoming schedule of teams that are in Orlando, Boston, OKC, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, Boston, Milwaukee. So again, depending on what those teams have to play for, how hard they're trying. I mean, Milwaukee could probably sit like several starters and still beat Washington. So, you know, that could push them in that direction whether they want to or not. Yeah. Anytime you can bring 70 bodies into a pandemic tournament, with a and their combined record is fifty and seventy nine. I, I guess you just ha- you can't resist the opportunity to bring fifth those two teams in. I mean, come why I just don't get it. But I, if I'm the NBA, I I say to Washington, your your lottery position is frozen. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if you go zero and eight. That, that I don't know that that's what they're going to do. I suspect that's what they'll do. But you you cannot. Charlotte and Chicago will have better lottery odds than you, no matter how you perform. Uh, in this tournament, the more interesting is the flip side of that. What if, what if Washington makes the playoffs? What if Portland, New Orleans, Sacramento, San Antonio 
makes the playoffs and Memphis in number eight now and Brooklyn slash Orlando in number seven, eight now do not. Um, does Memphis then become a lottery team or do you freeze the standings as they are now and say, nope, Memphis for the purposes, Memphis is not in the draft lottery. They are, are frozen outside of the draft lottery where they are now. Um, obviously this is of great interest to the Celtics who own the Memphis Grizzlies pick, uh, with top six protection, which means that the Grizzlies keep it if it falls within the top six and otherwise Boston gets it. Um, Boston would, and would, would I think love for Memphis to get into the lottery because it raises the possibility of them bumping up a little bit, um, or get, at least getting the 13th pick or for whatever it is. Um, and if Memphis actually gets into the lottery and goes into the top three, or the top six, whatever. What do what they draw? Four or three now? I can't remember. They draw four. They draw four. So if they get into the top four, all the pick does is roll over to next season, in which case it's unprotected. And I think Boston would much prefer unprotected Memphis 2021 pick to the 17th pick or the 16th pick in this draft because as great as Memphis's season has been by, by uh, relative to expectations and given the youth of their roster – Depending on what a few teams do in the Western Conference in the offseason this year, the West is going to be loaded this year. And, and I, you know, I, I think there are going to be some, I think Memphis fans in particular are going to, are, I think Memphis, there's always one team that outperforms expectations one year and creates a baseline expectation for the following year that it is actually cannot meet. And I think Memphis is that team. I think Memphis has created a baseline expectation of we're going to be a playoff team next year. Maybe they will be, but I think the chances of that are probably less than what most fa- most Memphis fans conceive of. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, I th- I kind of feel like though there's some ways like both Boston and Memphis might prefer to roll it over to 21 in some ways because Memphis would look at it as, hey, Jaws young, Jaron Jackson's young, we're going to be a year more experienced, a year better in 21. But from Boston's standpoint, even if that's possible, the potential upside of that being a top five pick, which is not possible this year, is probably a bigger deal for them than having another pick in the middle of the first round that they've had several of in recent vintage to uh, middling returns, I would say, I guess. So what's the uh, I, what's the fair way to handle this then? In a scenario in which a current, in, in a current eighth seed falls out of the playoffs and someone that's currently in the lottery replaces them, what do you think the NBA should do? What's fair? I think you treat them like you would any other team that's in the lottery because I mean, it's the same thing as, you know, all the time there are teams in the East playoffs with weaker records than teams that are in the lottery in the West. And, you know, those teams still pick ahead of the East teams that made the playoffs. That's just kind of, I think what we've established is, Hey, you know, the, the lottery is your solve for not making the playoffs. And in this case, the team that lost the play in would not. Yeah. I, again, I don't know what they're going to do. I, I hope I don't even know if we're going to find out for sure tomorrow. Uh, I hope we do. But my my if I had to predict, I would say they're just going to handle it like normal. So if Memphis falls out of the playoffs, Memphis becomes a lottery team. We're not freezing. We're not freezing the lottery as of March 11th uh, when Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID. We're just going to these are regular season games. You're either going to make the playoffs or not. And if you don't make the playoffs, you become a lottery team. And Boston has a little party at its headquarters. And similar for whatever else happens in, in the East. If Washington somehow makes the playoffs, Washington's out of the lottery. You don't get a lottery pick anymore. And Brooklyn, imagine if Brooklyn got a lottery pick. Imagine if Brooklyn got a lottery pick and then somehow moved up in the lottery and all of a sudden Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant get a top five lottery pick to either trade or, or use on a good player. That would be interesting. I mean, that's a team that, you know, much more so than Memphis would seem to have incentive to want to try to keep the protected pick this year where, uh, you know, it's it's lottery protected for them. And next year, they should be substantially better, you would assume, with a healthy Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant. Boy, this is really – who are you most interested to see? Who are you feeling – who are you feeling good about and bad about? I mean, it feels like six years ago, but who are, what, what are some of the playoff storylines that, you know, or series you want to see or whatever sort of strikes your fancy is? We're actually – this is actually going to happen. So go from this format to wherever you want to go. What's what What's interesting to you? 
I think Portland. I mean, this is a team we never got to see. You mentioned, by the way, the teams that set a baseline in one year, and then it's not realistic for them to achieve that the next year. I mean, I, I was there at media day when they were talking about being better than the teams that got to the conference finals yeah. last year. I, I had run the projections that, that said that they were going to be around a 500 team. And, you know, we never got to really find out what they were because, you know, they knew that Yusuf Nurkic was going to miss an extended period of time. They did not know that Zach Collins, who was – absolutely critical to all of their plans for this season was going to have to undergo shoulder surgery after three games uh, that Rodney Hood was going to rupture his Achilles. And now all of a sudden you got a chance. Hood's not going to be back, but Collins and Nurkic, you could see how they actually work together as a front court with Hassan Whiteside, presumably coming off the bench, Carmelo Anthony, maybe coming off the bench, which how that unfolds will be fascinating to watch. They're a team that could look entirely different when we see them in Orlando than when we saw them in March. And Collins just gives them so much more versatility, his ability to play both center and power forward, presumably for them, and stretch the floor if his jumper is a little better than, you know, I actually think he's going to be an okay jump shooter. But, you know, I mean, I just keep going back to, I think that's interesting. I think how three to seven shakes out in the West is is interesting for just for matchup purposes. And, you know, I don't think I ever asked you this question on a podcast. You know, I've been playing this game all year of, uh, Buck, I call it Buck's fear factor, Milwaukee fear factor, because they've been so far ahead of everybody in the East all season. Who, who's your team in the East that you look at as that's the team that, that's the team that's got the best shot at Milwaukee in a seven game series? I think it's probably Toronto because of, you know, even though they obviously don't have the same ability to have the best player in a se- in the series that they did last year with Kawhi, but that's that's still a really interesting contrast between Nick Nurse's willingness to make things up on the fly and, you know, really change dramatically from game to game and Bud's philosophy of this is what we do, this is what's gotten us here and this is what we're going to continue to do until it becomes clear that it's not going to work anymore. So, uh, I, I think that's the, uh, e- even if Toronto isn't the most talented of these opponents, I still think that's the matchup that would scare me the most is the box. I agree with you. By the end of the season, I had put Toronto into that, um, into that bucket. I, I, I think Boston is right next to them. And, you know, look, I picked Philly, um, I picked Philly to make the finals before the season. And, you know, I, I still think, I, I think the layoff could actually quite uh, help Philly because Ben Simmons is going to be healthy. Um, some of this will depend on what kind of condition Joel Embiid returns in. Um, but Horford that strikes me as a player who really could use – the downtime could be helpful to sort of being fresh for the playoffs. Um, and I like the way they can match up with people. But more and more um, – unless and until Ben Simmons develops a willingness to shoot – I, I know that Jimmy Butler marginalized him for much of the playoffs last year. You know, I dunker spot Ben Simmons just hanging out in the dunker spot, scrounging offensive rebounds and transition opportunities. I get that. That's not what you pay Ben Simmons a max for. It does feel like they're missing the ingredient that Butler gave them as sort of an alpha playmaker who could get to the line. I mean, Butler's Jimmy Butler's free throws this year are ridiculous. He's averaging like 10 free throws per 36 minutes. It's like James Harden level stuff going on in Miami, a little bit under the radar, frankly. Um, they missed that, I think, more than I anticipated they would. And so my faith in Philly kind of putting it together this season for a playoff run has waned. And I think a, t- a tribute to Toronto is, you know, I'm doing my all-defense teams right now. And I was supposed to have Arnovitz on this week to, to do pick our make our picks. And the Raptors are second in defense. And I'm sitting there. I, you only get 10 slots for all-defense, right? Two guards, two forwards, and a center. And then that same alignment on a second team. I'm sitting here like, I got to find space for a Raptor. A Raptor deserves to be among these 10 guys. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find space for a Raptor. And the reason is they just have a bunch of really good. I I, I don't know that they have like a stopper stopper, like a just a Kawhi, Giannis, AD level individual defensive player. Um, Anunobi, I think, could grow into that. Siakam, when he dials it in can be that. And I think he took a half step back this year on defense for a quarter step back, which happens when you suddenly are asked to average 23 points a game. But all of their guys are like a minuses just across the board. Everybody that's coming into the game, they're, they're all a minuses defensively. And in fact, if you talk and, and maybe that doesn't get you on all defense, but you put all a minuses on the floor defensively, 
who all communicate, many of whom can switch across multiple positions, you have a chance to be really good. And by the way, I surveyed a lot of opposing coaches about who's the best defensive player on the Raptors. Because I wanted to know if I pick one, who should it be? What do you think was the most common response I got back? And that's a great question because I can think of, as you just said, like six players. But because of the fact that you're asking this, I'm guessing I'm going to go with slight wild card, Fred Van Vliet. He came up here and there, uh, Marc Gasol, still. Okay. Yeah, this- still. And you, you hear other coaches who are listening and watching him up close will tell you what that guy is doing to organize their defense on a possession by possession basis is still the most valuable of all their defensive players. And I- I'm sorry to Marc Gasol. I, I, I love Marc. Um, you only get two centers on your all defense team and you have Joel Embiid and Rudy Gobert. And maybe you think Anthony Davis should be center if you want him on the first team. Hint, hint. Um, there's just not a lot of room for Marcus Soul, but that, that's how good, um, that's how good that team is on defense. So I, I agree with you. I do think it will be interesting to see, um, where Boston picks up because when we left Boston, they like Jason, the, the Jason Tatum thing had come down back to earth a little bit. And Kemba Walker was dealing with knee issues, and and I just think they're an interesting pickup where you left off team because they're deep and they're nasty and they have a versatility that also appeals to me when you're talking about playing the Bucks. The two of us literally left Boston because, as you mentioned earlier, there we, we were there for the Sloan Sports Conference and saw Utah get a really nice win against them. And on then the OKC absolutely steal a win. Were you at that game? I, I was not. I was watching part of that at the airport when my flight was delayed home. So, uh, you know, I, I, I went back and rewatched that after the fact. But yeah, I, it, it'll be interesting to see how much of the time off helps Kimball Walker's knee. You mentioned it helping out Horford. I think Walker could be a big beneficiary as well. Um, lots of interesting angles. I'm, I'm trying to look at the West. I mean, you know, there's Houston sort of quietly scuffled all the way back to sixth before, um, before the playoffs started and, uh, before the season was suspended, rather, and and people began to think, I wonder if the the super small thing is not actually going to work. Where did you leave off on Houston? Again, it feels like six years ago. Oh, Clint Capella is gone. They're playing with no center. Robert Covington's averaging like two and a half blocks a game. All of a sudden, where did you leave off on the Rockets and the way they were playing? Right, I don't feel like I had a good feel for you know what they were, why they had fallen off. Besides for kind of the generalities that you talked about, because that wasn't something I dug into, and I don't think I had seen them a whole lot in that stretch while I was traveling. Uh, I, you know, what I think is interesting is I, I feel like in that three through six group in the Western Conference, and again, maybe you throw Dallas in there as well. That feels like it's really going to be less about who's the better team and more about how you match up with these opponents. Like if I'm Utah, I don't know that I want any part of Houston in the first round. It's interesting that Denver probably feels the same way, although Denver was the team that sort of put the trap James Harden everywhere strategy on the map in one successful regular season game in November that they won. But Harden has torn them apart in previous games. Um, but Houston was, was scuffling a little bit and, and, and they were starting to show cracks in, in, in that style of play. But they're still a team again that is, is, is a problem for a lot of teams. Oklahoma City, they just, they're just, they just, they just find ways. They're a smart, nasty team. They're gritty and they, they play both ends pretty well. I, I, you know, that's, that's a good team. That's not going to be pleasant to play against. Who was your pick to win the whole thing? Who was your championship pick? It's been the Clippers, and now that they don't have to deal with having home court disadvantage, especially against the Lakers, which, you know, seven games at Staples Center, if that series came to pass, would have been, uh, you know, a big de- detriment for them. But against Milwaukee, potentially as well, I, I think it kind of strengthens that. Although it's weird, you know, just the fact that it's been so long since we've seen them, it feels like they're in some ways getting less buzz because of the fact that they're third in the standings or fourth in the standings, I should say. Um, yeah, the Clippers have been my pick all year, and, and you know I, we'll, we'll see. But I, I've I've liked their team all season. I like how Marcus Morris fits their team. Um, you know they they have some issues like every team, but I, I I like I think they're the most complete playoff team. Well, I shouldn't. I, I don't know if they're the most complete playoff team. The Lakers and the Bucks are pretty damn complete. But I, I've always I've had the Clippers from the beginning of the year, and I I see no reason to uh, to deviate from that. Um, interesting, by the way. Speaking of defense, I, as long as I have you, I might just steal. I might just steal your take here. I might as well steal your take. 
If you're looking at first-team all-defense forwards, okay? This has been a dilemma keeping me up at night before real life started keeping me up at night much more. Um, Giannis is a lock. I think Giannis is Defensive Player of the Year. Um, Agreed. And if you think that Anthony Davis should qualify as a forward and not a center because he played about two-thirds to three-quarters of his minutes at forward this year and they built their entire team based on the idea that Anthony Davis was going to be a power forward a lot... Um, then you have one forward slot on your first team for Anthony Davis, who was maybe the defensive player of the year front runner for the first 30 games of the season, or Kawhi Leonard, who I think probably around 20 games into the season hit 90%, 95% of San Antonio Kawhi Leonard, who was just taking the ball from dudes with, without, without, you know, any provocation. Just, I'm taking the ball. Thank you. Sorry, Ben Backlemore. Yeah. Uh, who do you think who who was a better defensive player this year? So I haven't looked at this closely yet. I I haven't done any of the of my all defensive work, but uh, I I would lean towards Kawhi. I mean, it's interesting that his uh, his adjusted plus minus is up there with anyone in the league at the defensive end of the court, which is kind of fascinating because he had a few years where his plus minus impact was not what you would think it would be based on his rep. And, you know, a couple of years ago, it seemed to 2017, like the last full year he played with the Spurs, it seemed to mostly be about the fact that opponents were just getting lucky shooting threes when he was on the court. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to believe that's something that, you know, an individual player really has much control over. So now we have, you know, some luck adjustments for that sort of thing in plus minus, uh, last year in Toronto, it just didn't seem like his effort was there at that same level defensively. This year it is, and we know what hit terror he is at that end, and and Davis has not made the same kind of plus minus impact. So I would I would lean towards Kawhi with that second spot. Yeah, I think it actually would qualify as a surprising Luke Luke Warmish, like not quite burn your hand on the pot take, but like a, a Luke Warmish take, like ooh that stung a little bit that Kawhi had a better defensive season than Anthony Davis, but I think Kawhi had a better defensive season than Anthony Davis, and I I think both of them were. Absolutely outstanding. May well be numbers two and three on my defensive player of the year ballot. Um, I think what I might do, well, I don't want to say what I might do. I might cheat and put Anthony Davis at, as my first team center. Um, and because I think they all deserve a spot on the first team. But anyway, I mean, boy, I hope we get there, man. I hope, I hope everyone just stays safe and healthy and they pull this off without, without much of a hitch because, you know, the risk is there and, you can only mitigate it so much, but um, apparently this is the format that we're going to get. 22 teams, for some reason, two play-in mini-series, and uh, and what in what percentage of the Western Conference simulations did we get a play-in? Like 90-something? 90 95, give or take. So. so Memphis, good luck to you. You're probably going to be involved in a play-in against... Did you do in what percent? I don't. You probably don't know this, but was it almost always Portland and New Orleans, or did San Antonio crack in there sometimes? So the one thing is, I can't completely vouch for this. I mean, first off, again, fake schedule. But second off, yeah, I don't know that. Like my my projection system is not designed to handle teams that played you know the one full game, two full games more than another issue that we talked about earlier. So I don't know that I handled that completely correctly with some of the tiebreakers, but. New Orleans was a little less than half the time. Portland and Sacramento were about a quarter of the time. And then San Antonio about 10% of the time. That's it, huh? And the Spurs, by the way, sitting on a 22 year playoff streak. Right. Um, a lot, a lot righty on that. It's a big, that's a big deal. Uh, I have to say, I do think a, a Memphis versus really any of those teams play in mini series. Memphis win one, two chances to win one. Other teams got to win two in a row, whatever it is. Um, uh, I think that's, that's, could be fun. So we'll see what happens. Um, KP, did we, did we not, did we not hit on anything that's important to you? Did we not hit on any quirky stuff that you want to hit on with this setup? Well, we didn't talk about the mini, minivan replacing Boyan Bogdanovich in Utah. So, uh, Georgia Sniang is the minivan. Uh, he called, he, he nicknamed himself the minivan because he compared himself to a minivan rev, taking a long time to rev up and not a sports car. Yeah, as opposed to the other jazz players were sports cars in that, in that analogy, right? I think that's a killer injury for them. I, I think that's a huge, I think the, I, I mean, I don't, maybe I'm, I, I don't, what, I know you wrote about it. I think it's a massively impactful injury because they don't really have, you know, I, I mean, it's, it sounds 
silly and reductive to say they don't have a player like Boyan Bogdanovich. Duh, he's a unique human being, but a stretch four who really shoots a lot of threes, not like a choosy stretch four, but a really, really, really dangerous stretch four who can guard opposing fours if, if you want Royce O'Neal to guard wings. They just don't have someone, they get smaller, they get a little more homogeneous in their perimeter players, like they have a lot of dudes who need the ball, and Bogdanovich is not one of those guys, really. And Niang, I love Niang, but he's overstretched as a starter if that's the route that they go. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the most logical one because they just get so small when they put Ingles and O'Neal out there. And I, until I looked it up, I didn't realize, I, I I can't remember them doing this off the top of my head, but I think it was like 15 minutes all season that, you know, Conley, Mitchell, O'Neal, and Ingles had played. Which is pretty crazy, but then you think of all the injuries. It's still crazy, even with all the injuries. All the guys going in and out of the starter role, reserve role, you know, Ingles has played both roles all season. I think that's a really, I think that's a bad injury for the Jazz and, um, and, and really hurts their chances even to win. I mean, look, winning a round in the West is no joke as the Jazz know, as the Jazz know very well. All right, KP, um, I, thank you for helping me dissect this. God knows that my head is spinning looking at all these permutations. So I'm glad that your supercomputer was functioning, uh, in your lair out there in Seattle. Um, everybody, he's already, you've already written a reaction piece to this online. You can go read that. Everybody knows where to find you. Kevin Pelton, um, uh, be healthy, be safe, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Right back at you.